Good morning, everyone. My name is Gail Kurtzman, and I am the Director of Programs and Events at Beth Tikva Synagogue. And on behalf of our Adult Education Committee, I would like to welcome you today to the last of our three-part series. We don't call it Ripped from the Headlines, but we titled it Straight from the Headlines yeah. uh, with lawyer and researcher Eric Gertner. Today's topic will be uh, geoarchaeology or the discovery of mass graves. And uh, in addition to everyone who's here with us today at the synagogue, I welcome you um, for those who are also joining us online. And please, for those of you who are online, feel free to join in our, in on our conversation by writing your comments or questions in the chat. And Daniel is here to moderate uh, that discussion for us as well. And now I'll hand it over to Eric. Thank you, Gail. Okay, so just a few opening remarks. Uh, first of all, I wanted to mention, as Gail perhaps already knows, uh, I will be doing a course on Institute. I did a similar course before the last presidential election. And uh, I'm planning to do this course in uh, October, November, December of this year. So if you're interested, intrigued, upset by what you hear in the news, uh, you might want to uh, join the Life Institute and register for the course. It's being done on Zoom. Uh, so they're not limited to their usual 100 people. The last time I taught a course on Trump, there were almost 200 people uh, listening in on Zoom. I also, uh, it's sort of generally my practice to, to uh, bring news of the topics that I've been talking about uh, that have happened in the last couple of weeks. So here's some of the stories uh, that you may have seen or you may not have seen. So in respect of abortion, you may have read that the state of Georgia is introducing tax legislation, which will allow people who are pregnant to claim the fetus as a dependent for purposes of tax, even before the child is born. Um, there's a funny case in Texas where a woman driving in the HOV lanes uh, was stopped by the police because she was the only person in the car and she is fighting the ticket because she was pregnant. So therefore there are two people in the car because as we know, a fetus is a person. Um, in Arizona, uh, they're attempting to add uh, the notion of personhood to fetuses to uh, Arizona law. You probably have heard about the results of the Kansas referendum to amend their constitution. Uh, abortion is now uh, protected under the Kansas state constitution and the Republicans in Kansas who control the, the legislature uh, introduced a resolution during the primary, which was held on August 2nd on the belief that fewer people would come out to vote. And therefore there was a good chance that the referendum to limit abortion uh, more than it is now would pass much to their surprise. Uh, that didn't happen. The turnout for the uh, primary was enormous, and uh, the people objected to the change in the law in the Kansas state Kansas constitution by a majority of about fifty seven uh, to forty three or whatever the math is it's in that figure. So that was a big shock to everybody. The last prediction I heard before the primary was it was going to be close. So they were like one percent apart. Well, that didn't happen. The Department of Justice in the U.S. is suing Idaho because of their changes to their abortion law. Uh, last week, uh, President Biden introduced new executive orders to try to guarantee the right to travel for women to go from one state to the other without facing possible criminal uh, consequences. And uh, just to bring you up to date on a matter I think I did mention, which is the suit in Florida by a rabbi challenging the Florida law attempting to restrict abortion. That suit has now been joined by a number of clergies from other religions, so stay tuned. We'll see what happens. Insofar as uh, my talk on genocide, you may have seen that there are stories about what has happened to some of the defenders at this, the famous steel plant who uh, ultimately gave themselves up to the Russians. There's a story that the site where they were being held as POWs was bombed and Russia is claiming that Ukraine did it and Ukraine is claiming that Russia did it. This is all the part of the fog of war, as they say. 
Um, and then uh, we're, we're still hearing stories about what's going on at the uh, nuclear plant in Ukraine, which was captured by the Russians. The story I heard this morning on the news was that there are Russian soldiers who are using the nuclear plant as their shield to protect themselves from bombs from uh, Ukraine. And today I'm talking about, uh, as, as uh, Gail said, uh, geoarchaeology and the uncovering or discovering of mass graves. And this morning I read that one of the people I'll be talking about recently received, like within the last few days, an award from the Treblinka Museum for her contributions to uh, understanding what happened at the camp. So we'll hear about that in a moment. So when I started uh, researching this topic and, and writing out my remarks, I had a plan. The plan was sort of derailed over the last couple of weeks as a result of an article that appeared in uh, a magazine called Quillet, which I assume is some kind of version of quill, like paper pen or pen that was used to write. Um, and the article is written by Jonathan Kay, who you may know was uh, an editor of the National Post. He's an editor of Quillette, and he's still an op-ed editor and writer for the National Post. And the article, it's, it's quite a lengthy article devoted to what has been happening in respect of uh, 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 unmarked graves at residential schools, in, uh, particularly in Western Canada. And the article uh, basically is, is his, I would say, screed, complaining about the media's response to the stories about these possible unmarked grave. And the point that he makes is, why are we, is everybody so excited? There are no, no bodies have been uncovered yet. No bodies have been unearthed yet. So why is this hysteria happening? His article is entitled, A Media-Fueled Social Panic Over Unmarked Graves. Now, I'm here in Toronto. I don't see any social panic about unmarked graves. And perhaps there isn't even enough panic about what has happened uh, on these residential school sites. So I find, I find the article a bit offensive. He cites uh, a number of articles which claim that there were bodies recovered or uncovered. And as he says, well, you know, this is just the first step using uh, uh, this GPR technology to find possible mass graves or unmarked graves. And as he said, no bodies have been recovered. Um, and he cites a number of, as I said, a number of articles, and he's particularly harsh on the New York Times, which stories appear to say that bodies were in fact uncovered uh, from these, from these uh, graves on the residential school sites. But the reality is when these uh, attempts to find these unmarked graves are undertaken, they're not just undertaken willy-nilly. They're undertaken on the basis of information that exists or that information that they have from survivors or families of survivors. Um, because otherwise going to a site uh, that's acres in size would make no sense. You have no idea what you're looking for. So when they go into the, these kinds of sites, they have a pretty good idea of what they are likely to find. They might not know how the bodies have been buried, whether they're in single graves or mass graves, where exactly the bodies are located, but they have a pretty good idea. The author of this article in Quillette says is contrary to what uh, can can many Canadians came to believe during the heady period, GPR survey data doesn't yield X-ray style images of what lies below the surface. Mm -hmm. What is typically sh shows are uh, disruptions in soil and sediment. Investigators then need to dig up the ground to determine what actually lies underneath. And that, of course, is true. But his insinuation is this is all being made up. Uh, we haven't really got any real evidence yet, and therefore we shouldn't be uh, having all these stories about the possibility of unmarked graves in many residential school sites. So the reality is, of course, that, that as I've said, there are there is evidence from survivors at these school sites that kids went missing that have never been found. Uh, there's information from uh, their, the, the uh, people who were in the schools who may not yet have yet have survived 
but they passed on the information to their children or other relatives. This is not unusual in the way of attempting to uncover these kinds of uh, circumstances, whether they be mass graves or unmarked individual graves. And as you will hear, the process that is being used at these residential school sites is no different than the process that has been used to discover other unmasked graves, whether in relation to the Holocaust or other genocides that I mentioned uh, last time we met. Um, as I said, there's probably information from survivors, there's probably information from descendants of survivors who are no longer with us. And as you'll see, that's exactly the process that's also used to uncover uh, mass graves from the period of the Holocaust or other periods as well. So I think um, the article really upset me and that's why I'm focusing so much on the article. And of course, it's not the only article that's appeared. There's another article that, that I'm gonna mention, which appears in, in a publication called from the Front, Frontier Center for Public Policy, written by somebody named Brian Giesbrecht. And his article, which I have here, uh, the, the key line, the title is, it's time to move on. And basically what he says is again, like why, why is there this big fuss? No bodies have been recovered. It's time to move on. There are more important stories to cover. And I'm gonna tell you a little story. When I was a, an articling student at a major law firm in Toronto, um, I was obviously interested that my parents being survivors in the Holocaust. And I was reading uh, what was then a very important book, the book by Lucy Davidovich called The War Against the Jews, which was her study of uh, the period of the Holocaust. I happened to be going to lunch one day and I was carrying the book and one of the partners of the firm uh, standing at the elevator with me and said, well, what are you reading? And I showed him the book and he said, hasn't that story already been told? This is 1974. Just think of all the information that we've learned about the Holocaust since 1974. The story had been told, at least what we knew, but the information that we're learning even today is still new information in many respects. So to title an article, it's time to move on, is just something that really irked me. And here's what the author says. It is now becoming increasingly clear that the claims about murdered and secretly buried residential school children are highly suspicious, if not completely false. To date, we know that there are no mass graves. Nobody said there was a mass grave. And no bodies of residential school children have been exhumed. And there's a good reason for that, which I'll mention in a minute. The evidence that there are uh, any students' bodies buried in unmarked graves at the school is increasingly looking shaky. Now, I have no idea what information this author had to make that kind of statement, but the reality is, and he focuses particularly on the first discovery at one of the residential schools on Kamloops, the reality is that those potential uh, individual graves were located about a year ago, a little more than a year ago, and no, they have not dug up any bodies from the site. And there's a good reason for that. The, the indigenous community whose children might be buried on that site are debating amongst themselves what to do, whether to actually unearth the bodies and rebury them or leave them where they are undisturbed. This is, again, not unusual in respect of these kinds of uh, situations. So to castigate the reports of these unmarked graves uh, and that they may not even exist, I think is pretty premature. And as I said, the process for looking for these unmarked graves, as, as in the case of the Holocaust, is the same with respect to these residential schools. There are people who attended these schools. They know that there are kids who disappeared. Whoops, should have turned that off. I will do that right now. Uh, so I, I think, you know, they, they're jumping to, they should have already in, uncovered these bodies. Okay, so let me uh, turn to uh, 
the Holocaust in particular in respect to von Marquez, but I'm gonna mention others as well. So we know that the, the war against the Jews starts in 1939, uh, but the real killing begins in 1941 after the Nazis uh, break the agreement that they had with Russia, the Molotov -Rib von Ribbentrop agreement, which divided Poland and which uh, Nazi Germany breached by attacking uh, the Soviet Union. It's then when the Nazi troops occupy Eastern Europe and that the killing really begins. And of course, we know that in 1942 in January, the leading Nazi officials meet at Wannsee in Germany, just outside Berlin, uh, to plan the final solution. Well, as it's become apparent, uh, they weren't planning the final solution. The final solution was well underway by the time they were meeting in 1942. What they were doing in 1942 was planning how the rest of the final solution was gonna be carried out. By 1942, um, there were already mass killings in Eastern Europe. We know that in Ukraine alone, Ukraine of that period, there were over a million Jews who were killed. One of the largest mass graves was, of course, in Ukraine at Babayar, where there were somewhere between 31 and 31,000 people murdered in a matter of a number of days. We also know that in Eastern Europe, uh, in Lithuania, for example, where there was a Jewish population of 200,000 before the war. Virtually all of that population was murdered. It's like, I just expected that about 95, 90% of the Jews were murdered. Many of them were murdered outside uh, what was then Vilna, which is now Vilnius, in a place called the Ponar Forest. And you'll hear a little bit more about that in a moment. And of course, the majority of the population, the vast majority of the population, in Latvia and uh, Estonia were also murdered in this period of what's now become known as the Holocaust by bullets. They weren't, Jews were not being uh, put into slave labor camps. They were basically taken out of their cities or their villages, taken to sites outside the town or in a forest, near a ravine in many cases, and murdered by either German uh, soldiers or the SS or uh, local pop population members who were anti-Semitic and their, their bodies were covered up by, uh, by earth and just left there, at least initially. Uh, so the, about, it's estimated about 2.5 million Jews were killed in the Holocaust by bullets and about 3 million in the concentration camps. And even at the concentration camps, as you'll hear, not everybody was uh, killed in the gas chambers, and then cremated. Uh, some of those people were also buried, and some people have ultimately been uh, uncovered in these mass graves. So the, the Holocaust by bullets becomes uh, well known in the last, I'd say, 20 years, largely because of the efforts of a Catholic priest named Father Patrick Debois. And Father Patrick Debois uh, has a grandfather who was a, a soldier and was imprisoned in a camp in an area of the Ukraine. And at some point in the early 2000s, Father Patrick Dubois wanted to go to this town to see where his grandfather had been held prisoner. And he realizes that given his knowledge of the war, uh, that many people were murdered, obviously, in the Ukraine. And in fact, at the camp where his father was detained and where many people were killed, there is actually no marker to memorialize the people killed there. And he was very disturbed by this. And so he has made it his mission over the last 15 or more years to go around uh, parts of Eastern Europe where the Holocaust by bullets was carried out to try to discover mass graves or even individual graves, um, and to memorialize them because he realizes that's an important part of history. It's an important part of Eastern Europe history, and it's an important part of the history of the Jews who lived in that part of the world. So he creates an organization called Yahad Un, Un Unum, and you can go on the website and find out what he's up to. He estimates that there are 
certainly at least 100,000 mass graves in the Ukraine alone, let alone in Eastern Europe. Um, and again, as I said, it's his mission to try to find as many of these mass graves as possible and to commemorate the people who died there, usually from some local village or, or town. Mm -hmm. How does Father Patrick Dubois find out about these sites? He finds out about them just the way I described. He finds out what happened or might have happened nearby by talking to the villagers in the village nearby, some of whom are still alive from the time of the war. In other cases, it's their descendants to whom the information was handed down by the people who were living at these sites at the time of the war. And that's how he discovers these sites, how these sites are marked and commemorated. And this is, as I said, the same kind of process that's being used in the residential school cases, and it's been used in other places as well, as you'll hear. Now, you will have realized I haven't really mentioned any of the mass uh, death camps. Uh, there are obviously six major death camps, Auschwitz, Treblinka, Majdanek, Chalno, Sobibor, and Belzic. And the murder rates in these places obviously varied. In, if you go to the camp or the site of the camp at Belzic, you will realize that about half a million Jews were murdered in a period of months. There, weren't, there wasn't a labor camp there. This was just a death camp. People were brought there by train or they walked there. They were sent up this row uh, with trees on both sides so they didn't know where they were going. And when they ended up at the end, that's where they were killed. So obviously at these kinds of sites, we're not looking at mass graves as such because we know many of the people who were murdered in these camps were murdered in the gas chambers as was the case in Auschwitz and in Majdanek um, and in other places. Um, and so what we have are not bodies that are buried, we have huge collections of ashes. Even in the camps where people were not cremated, like Treblinka originally, when the Germans realized that the Soviet Union soldiers were marching west and that they were likely to be overrun, they had people, prisoners at these camps, dig up the corpses that had been buried there and create a huge pyres to burn the bodies and just have the ashes left over. And this, as I said, happened in many places. There's um, a recent story in a, a, a work camp in Poland where people were murdered and were buried and ultimately had to be uh, unearthed and then burned, where it was, it's estimated that this mass grave contained the ashes of 8,000 people. How do they know that? They know what the average, now this is sort of how depraved we've become. They know what the weight of the ashes of an individual person would weigh. And so they uncovered 15.8 tons of ashes, which they estimate equaled about 8,000 people. This is the science of, uh, of the Holocaust and of mass murder. One of the individuals involved in, in a lot of these efforts is a professor, Richard Freund. And sadly, Richard Freund passed away uh, in the middle of July. And he is uh, one of the people who has been involved in a number of, of investi archaeological investigations. He's the author of a book called The Archaeology of the Holocaust, Vilna, Roads, and Escape Tunnels. Uh, so Richard Freund has been involved in a number of projects, as you can imagine. Uh, one of the projects he was involved in uh, relates to uh, the mass killing site outside of Vilna or Vilnius in the Ponar forest, which Judy and I had the privilege, I guess, to visit. Um, and what the project was at Ponar was not finding bodies because they knew this was a burial site. What 
they were trying to discover or locate was an escape tunnel. So the story that he had heard and that he was trying to confirm was that when the, uh, again, when the Nazis realized that the Soviet Union forces were marching east, that they were unlikely to cover uncover what had happened at the Ponar Forest site, they got 80 Jews, which they formed into a Sunder commando, and had them dig up the bodies so that they could be burned. The, among these 80 Jews, obviously some of them realized that once their job was finished, that they would be the last victims there. And so they planned and built a tunnel to escape from the burial site um, and obviously hope to, uh, to make it to freedom. And in fact, the tunnel was built and it's estimated that about almost all of the Sandra commandos still alive attempted to escape. They all got through the tunnel, but the vast majority were recaptured by the Nazis and murdered. It's estimated that about 11 or 12 of the members of the Sandra commando in fact made it out and survived after the war. So this story was known. The question was, how do you prove that the story, the story was true? And so Professor Richard Foyne, as I said, made it his job to try to verify the story. And so they undertook this kind of uh, geo-archaeological uh, study of the area of the mass grave and pit in the, in the Ponar Forest, and they actually uncovered the escape tunnel. So they verified the history of the escape of these Jews from their work at Ponar, which obviously is important for a variety of number of reasons. It confirms the history, but it's also important to recognize, again, the myth that Jews didn't resist. Well, these people obviously resisted. They risked their lives to potentially escape death. And as I said, about 10 or 11 of them actually did escape. So Richard Freund was in He also, um, before his death in the last few years, was, was involved in uncovering remains of the great synagogue that stood at, uh, in the Jewish area of Vilna. Uh, it was the synagogue of the Gaon of Vilna. Uh, and the synagogue was destroyed, but they've now uncovered large parts of that synagogue including the area where the, the Bima was, I believe, and where the, uh, the Ark was. Um, so he's also, he was also involved in that. And I've provided you a link to one of his other uh, endeavors, which was trying to confirm the site where a family was buried in, in uh, Lithuania outside a small village. And it's uh, the story of the search for Matilda Olkin. Matilda Olkin was a teenager. She was, sometimes people refer to her as the Anne Frank of Lithuania. She was not, she didn't write a diary like Anne Frank. She, there is a diary, but it's not obviously the same as Anne Frank's, but she was a, a, a recognized poet. And there were, again, stories of the family having been taken to the forest, shot and buried in the forest. And so Richard Foyne's objective was to try to find the site where this family was buried, and obviously to mark that as an important site and to commemorate uh, their life. And he did it exactly the way I've been describing. He talked to the villagers. In fact, the first information about the possible site where this family was buried came from a, a person who was a girl at the time, the age of eight, who actually witnessed the, the marching of the family out to the forest and their murder. And so this, this now obviously older woman or members of her family were confirming the story and pointing Richard Freund and his team to the site of of, uh, of the murder and the burial. Uh, I, I know also that he was involved in, in uncovering parts of the, the hiding places in Mila 18. That was another project he'd been involved in. I don't know how that ultimately turned out, 
Uh, but so you can see that this geoarchaeology is important not just to find uh, the places where people were murdered and buried, or where their bodies were were buried, or their bodies were burned and buried, and their ashes were buried. It's also important to confirm parts of the history of the Holocaust, that story that's already been told. Well, we're not only been told, but we're now confirming that the story is actually true. And I've I've provided you with a link to a trailer for the documentary called Finding Matilda, the Anne Frank of Lithuania. And I don't want to uh, pretend that the only mass graves that exist are those in relation to the Holocaust. We know that's not true. And in the last few years, we've seen uh, major discoveries at the sites of other major Holocausts. Uh, in, in 2018, there was a, a mass grave of about 2,000 to 3,000 people uncovered in Rwanda. Uh, that obviously is a, a genocide that occurred in the early 1900s, 1990s, sorry. Uh, and there is another a discovery made in 2020 of about 800 uh, people who were buried in a mass grave. And it's estimated uh, that in that period from 2018 to 2020, uh, there were approximately 120,000 victims that they discovered in mass graves in Rwanda. And again, Rwanda, we all know about Rwanda, but that's also the story that we now are discovering in the sites of the famous uh, genocides in the former Yugoslavia. And it's also expected that we'll find mass grave sites uh, as a result of the revolution and civil wars in Libya. It's estimated there are 100 mass graves in Libya and, uh, and with bodies numbering about 250 in some of the graves that they've already discovered. In 2018, the human rights, uh, UN human rights body estimated that there were 200 mass graves to be discovered in Iraq as a result of the war with ISIS. And of course, even this year, we discovered the existence of mass graves as a result of the war in Ukraine with the discovery of bodies buried in the village of Buka. Stories initially were that there were maybe 200 or 250. The la last figure I saw is that they expect that there were about 450 or 460 bodies buried in that area as a result of the actions of the uh, soldiers of, of Russia. So I'm going to ask you a question. Why do we, why are we concerned about these things? Why should we spend time and effort to look for and discover these mass graves and in some cases unearth the bodies of victims from 100 years ago or 80 years ago or even 20 years ago? Well, I think the answers should be obvious to most of you, but I'm going to talk about a little bit about a number of the reasons why this kind of work is really important. It's important first to the extent that we can bring justice to the people involved or their families. It's important to discover uh, the evidence. So it's unearthing the evidence to support the possibility of prosecuting those involved in these heinous crimes. It's important, as we know personally, as a Jewish community, to have this evidence to prevent the denial of the history that we all know happened. I mean, when you think about the fact that the Holocaust is probably the most documented historical event in history, and yet there are people that deny that it ever happened or the extent of what happened, uh, you can understand why it's important that these efforts be undertaken uh, to ensure that people can't deny what happened as you know as long ago as 80 or 90 years ago or a few months ago. Finding the these mass graves of family members who are still alive is important to pr provide closure to the families. Finding these sites are important because they need to be memorialized and the people need to be educated about what happened. 
even though they may not have been involved or their family members may not have been involved, it's important for the community to understand what happened in their in their community. And as we know with, uh, with what has been going on with the indigenous communities in Canada, it's important to find the truth. It's important to find the truth, not only just to have the truth, but to possibly reconcile between the uh, indigenous community and, and our own uh, generation. All right, let's move on. As I mentioned, uh, Father Patrick Dubois is not the only person involved in these kinds of efforts with respect to the Holocaust. There are a couple of uh, Polish individuals who were involved in doing this in their local communities. And they're doing it because they believe it's important for the people of Poland to know their own history, to know the past of the Jewish presence in Poland, which obviously is confirmed by the creation of this new uh, museum in, in Warsaw for the history of the Jews in Poland. Um, and it's also important as, as one of the individuals involved in this effort uh, to educate the people uh, of the, the area. So one of the individuals involved in these kinds of activities is a woman called Agnieszka uh, Nivaltko and another gentleman, Zbigniew uh, Nuzinski. The, the, the second person basically rides on his bicycle between the various communities to try to gain information about the possible sites where Jews were murdered. And then there's another individual whose uh, organization you can you can go on uh, on the web and find out about. It's called People Not Numbers. His name is Dariusz Popiela. He is a former Polish Olympic athlete who has made it his uh, job in life to try to educate the Polish community about what happened in Poland to the Jews. He's not Jewish, uh, but his his job is not only is not really so much to uncover unmarked graves, but to commemorate the people who died from these various communities. And you, if you go online and you see some of the videotape from his activities and how he engages the, pop, the, the local population, it's actually quite, quite moving. Um, now I, I said I would mention, uh, the woman who was involved in a lot of the work that's been going on in Treblinka. Uh, as a 21-year-old uh, college student or university student, Carolyn Sturdy Coles became interested in the whole area of discovering the archaeology of the Holocaust, obviously looking for mass graves. And she has recently, as of like this past week, been given an award by the uh, by the Treblinka Museum. She's the second person to receive this award, the Distinguished Service for the Treblinka Museum. And she's been involved in a number of excavations at Treblinka starting in 2007. And she's been, been involved in other activities. Again, just to show you that the, this is an important issue, not just for Jews, but for people in, interested in history and the history of uh, these various communities. Um, she's also involved in a project on one of the Channel Islands called Alderney, which was a site of a of German occupation and where people were in fact uh, imprisoned in camps. And so she spent some time discovering the location of the camp and re recovering artifacts from the camp. And she's also uh, in involved uh, and the subject matter of a number of documentaries about her work. Uh, in respect to Treblinka. So are there things that we are there things that we need to worry about when we're doing this kind of work or when people are doing this kind of work? Well, clear, clearly there are lots of things we need to worry about. We also need to worry about that in fact it, it is done. The work is done. And over the last decade or so, um, there have been a number of bodies, including the UN, uh, significantly involved in recognize the importance of this work and helping to fund the work and helping to provide guidance on how the work should be carried out. Um, so 
in in the earlier in, in the this decade, the UN General Assembly passed a resolution 6865, which is called the Right to Truth, which obviously supports the kinds of things I'm talking about. Um, at another university, um, there's a an archaeologist by the name of Melanie Klinker, who uh, is involved in looking for uh, mass graves of a variety of different historical events. And she and her group at her university have published something called the Bournemouth uh, Protocol, which helps to provide guidance about how to go about doing these things and uh, what care needs to be taken and how to deal with the family members who might be affected by what is discovered and how it's discovered. And the year 2000, there was a report from the UN about uh, the work of mass graves and uncovering mass graves. And here's the summary uh, that's provided by this, this report, which as I said, published in 2020. Uh, and it's just called Extrajudicial Summary and Arbitrary Executions. A summary reads as follows. The present report focuses on mass graves, highlighting the multitude of sites of mass killings and the unlawful death across history and the world. The special rapporteur presents one of the some of the complex uh, normative and practical issues raised by the existence of mass graves and identifies the range of stakeholders and claims in relations to their care and uh, management. She offers preliminary compendium of human rights standards and possible steps towards the respectful and lawful handling of mass graves. So when we talk about even what's happening here in Canada, this kind of report would obviously provide some guidance as to what should be done and how it should be done. Um, and there are other organizations involved and other documents that have been published to address these same kinds of issues. There's something called the International Commission on Missing Persons, who uh, published something called the Paris Principles, which again address these same sorts of issues. There's a UN Security Council Resolution 2474 that deals with the same thing. And the International Committee of the Red Cross in 2020 published a pamphlet, and I think you have a link to that as well, uh, called Accompanying the Families of Missing Persons, a Practical Handbook. Because as you can imagine, if we're dealing with a recent events, uh, the families obviously are interested in what happened uh, to their family members, and that relationship must be treated and dealt with uh, quite delicately. Uh, so here are some of the, uh, the principles that come out of the Bournemouth uh, Protocol. And again, they give you an idea of what we, are, we need to be concerned about. There must, uh, must be no harm there must be a no harm approach to avoid undermining existing uh, structures and relationships. So it's trying to maintain uh, the place where this might have occurred. The physical and environmental safety of all involved is paramount. The investigation should be independent and impartial. There must be confidentiality for information such as personal details and other identifying uh, data. All uh, stages of the process must be transparent. There must be must uh, be a commemoration strategy to envisage and accommodate the relatives affected by the work that's been going on. The investigator should not make uh, should not make uh, promises that they can't keep. There must be careful planning so it's actually done properly and to disturb the site as little as possible. The process must also consider the justice and commemorative aspects of the work that they're doing. And I've already read to you the, the section from the 2020, 2020 UN court. And, and all of the ports, reports that I've referenced basically follow the same kind of uh, principles. So where are we now? We are near the end. And what I think is important to understand is this is a process that unfortunately we are confronted with 
because of man's inhumanity to man. It's a process that will not end with the, the uh, war in Ukraine. It will undoubtedly happen again, but we need to appreciate the implications of the wars that are occurring or have occurred, the impact it has on history and our known history, and the impact it has on those who've survived. And it's important to recognize that even in the case of the present war in Ukraine, we know, of course, of mass murders in parts of Ukraine. We also know that the Russians have deported approximately a million Ukrainians to Russia. And their fate, of course, is not known yet, and maybe will never be known. We don't know. So this work is extremely important. The people involved in it are really, I think, uh, undertaking a mitzvah to discover these sites and providing some comfort to family members. And so I'm happy to now try to answer any questions you have. Um, one more. The, the, um, yeah, so I, I've sent to Gail a list of the of many of the sources I've uh, looked at and reviewed and are mentioned in, in my talk so far. Um, and I would encourage you to at least glance at, at many of these re reports and, and the information provided there, because I think this is an issue, as I just said, we're going to be living with this kind of issue, certainly for my lifetime, no doubt, and probably the lifetime of my children. And so it's important to recognize the importance of what has happened, is happening, and will happen in the future. And I think it's with this kind of information that we need to think about what's going on at the residential school sites in Canada, where it's now estimated they have discovered possibly 2,000 unmarked graves, and probably there are more. It's estimated that about 4,000 children who went missing from the residential schools. So we don't know what happened to all of them. And we, we know that some of them obviously died at the schools and were buried at the schools. We may not know exactly where, we, don't, we may not know exactly how many, but just as we expect that people respect the truth of the Holocaust, we should hope that people should understand the plight of our indigenous communities and how significant these discoveries are for them in a path towards, as the Canadian government has said, and as the commission has said, truth and reconciliation between our communities and the indigenous communities throughout the country. Yes. Is there any uh, uh, photo, photographic evidence of the tunnels in the United States? Yeah, I think, I think if you look at, there's a documentary about the escape tunnel, and you'll see a photograph of how they uncovered the tunnel and the story of how they uncovered the tunnel. Um, Eric, yes. Um, I guess the role of uh, technology has really advanced uh, this whole uh, field of mm -hmm. study. Yep. My question is, do you know like any? database where they've actually gone in and taken um, DNA and tried to match up families and victims because that, personally I would like to know <laughs> right. that my family uh, you know my my great grandparents or great aunts and uncles this is they yeah. found their DNA buried yeah. in this mass grave so I can have closure and know exactly what happened yeah to the extent that there are remains other than ashes. I'm not sure they can do it with ashes. Uh, so if there are even bone fragments, which exist in many of these sites, <coughs> um, they might possibly be able to uh, discover the DNA and find who these people might be related to. Because as we know with 23andMe and Ancestry and et cetera, mm -hmm. the, this data bank is increasing by leaps and bounds um, probably every day. So. That so is possible. Maybe while they can't do that with Holocaust victims, maybe unfortunately in Ukraine. I'm sure they will be doing that. I think they are doing that right now as they uncover these bodies that are unfortunately fresh in their graves. They can take DNA to connect them to uh, and allow the families to actually bury 
the bodies in, in a, an individual grave. I mean, there are some sites, <coughs> Holocaust related sites, where there's a debate as to whether, even if there are bodies, whether the bodies should be unearthed and reburied, because that is contrary, apparently, to halachic law. So there are communities where that has been done, and there are communities where that's not allowed to be done or it hasn't been done. And at the end of the war, what I read was that was pretty common to unearth the bodies and rebury them. Um, but you know, it's it, and I think that's a, an example. We see it with the residential school and the the site at Kamloops, where the the community itself has to decide what should be done. You know, should they decide it on an individual basis? Should they decide it on a community basis? I mean, these are not easy questions for people to uh, to deal with. Yes. In the residential school, how are these children, young children, how are they killed? How is the process of the killing taken Well, I, I don't know if there's that many kids who were actually killed, like in the sense of murdered, but there were kids who obviously died of disease. There are many cases of tuberculosis in many of these places. So the kids may have, but the, it's not just that they died. It's that when they died, they weren't returned to their families. These kids were taken from their families. They, most of the people who were in these residential schools didn't go voluntarily. They weren't sent by their families voluntarily. The purpose of the Canadian government was to, to kill the Indian in the Indian to uneducate them of their own ways, re-educate them. It's like, like what happened in communist China. You know, it was a re-education camp. There was a school. So, and of course, there, there are cases of sexual abuse, physical abuse, and some of those might have resulted in deaths of some of these children. So I think it's a whole panoply of the ways that these people might, these children may have died. But not knowing what happened is really the, the kicker, right? I mean, my mother, I think, knew that the family that she traveled to Auschwitz with that didn't survive, they were killed on their arrival. And the ones who were sent to work, like my mother and her brother, the only two who survived of eight kids, they survived because they were worked and they worked hard. And obviously even the people who were, were saved for work didn't survive. We know that. Yep. Um, in the uh, San Luis in the area where the graves are being stuck, but it's no surprise to anybody there. They always always knew about this. This is not a new thing. Right. But I think the only surprise is that people pay attention to it. Well, I think that it's people are paying attention, but we have to also understand that the technology that exists today, um, you know, it's really fairly modern technology. The, uh, the geo, the ground penetrating radar basically is discovered just over a hundred years ago. It's not even used up until really the 1970s for this kind of work. It's being used to an archeological digs for, for mining or other things like that, not used to discover the efforts of people to kill other people. And you're right, it's not, it's not a mystery that kids disappeared. I mean, the people, their families, no, they disappeared. They haven't turned up. I mean, you can't say, well, you know, it's like the, the people who deny the Holocaust. Well, you know, how do you know your family didn't survive? How do you know there are 6 million? Maybe they're in hiding somewhere. Maybe they're in Russia. Well, we know it's all nonsense. And so I think the way to respond to that is, yes, we know that kids were died at these residential schools. We know that obviously they were buried somewhere. We don't know exactly where. Some may have been buried on the sites of the schools. Some may, may have been buried in other places. But obviously there is information from the people who were at these schools. And that's in large part how they knew about the fact that there were people buried at some of these sites. They don't know how many with, it, with the exactness, but they know that there are people buried there. And again, there's a question about how to deal with the bodies that are in the ground. Okay. All so right. <laughs> not a happy subject. No, but no. necessary. <laughs>
Um, thank you, Eric. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for uh, this uh, interesting series. And um, we look forward to having you back again. I'm happy to have come back. Great. Okay. Um, one is. Are there any uh, before we wrap up? Any last questions or comments from anyone online? Nope. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Eric, and thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you.